It was Friday, 26 of May, 1967, the day that Sgt Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by the Beatles. By instant and general consent, the album of the much mythologized 60s hit the shops. I was 15 at the time, at an all-boys boarding school in Berkshire. That Friday afternoon, after morning lessons after lunch, the race was on to be the first to the record shop in the village to get hold of a copy. I think I was in fact the first, and later that afternoon, taking the record out of its sleeve, putting it on the turntable, and waiting for the needle to drop, was without doubt one of the most thrilling moments of my life. One of the pirate radio stations, Radio London, had already played the album, but otherwise the only place to hear it without actually buying it was in a listening booth at your local record shop or, or Radio Luxembourg or just possibly the BBC's light programme as the nation's youth waited for the imminent arrival of Radio 1. In May 1967, an imminent arrival too for the baby of unmarried 22-year-old Jennifer Archer. Jennifer was one of the young stars of BBC Radio's longest-running serial drama, The Archers, that this week notches up seven decades of storytelling. The Archers was first tried out in 1950, but gained a regular place on the light programme seven months later. I'm a writer on social history, and in this programme, I'm going to be taking a look at the way in which The Archers has, in its own dramatic terms, tried and sometimes fail to reflect the seismic social changes we've lived through in these 70 years, whether they're agricultural, ethical, political, or in the case of young Jennifer Archer's pregnancy, a question of social acceptability. At a time when what were then known as illegitimate babies were often taken away from mothers and sent for adoption, the stigma never quite forgotten. News of her pregnancy had split, not just the village, but her family. Jennifer? What's wrong? You look as if you've been crying. It's all right. It doesn't matter, Lillian. Now look, there isn't one of us that hasn't seen that there's something been upsetting you terribly just lately. I daren't. Of course you can. It's only between us and these four walls. Oh, Lillian. I've made... I've made such a terrible mistake. I don't mean... Yes. Don't tell anyone. Please don't. Yet. Oh, oh Jennifer. Oh, 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 Jennifer. It was the storyline of the decade, capturing the ears of a nation across nine long months as Jennifer's pregnancy developed. Are you all right, dear? I know I keep asking, but you do seem a bit off colour. Oh, I'm all right. At least... Yes? Mum? Yes, Jennifer? Uh, there's something that I must... Oh, do. there you are, Peggy. <laughs> you just missed something good on the telly. You Can see? Check. Hey? I'll see you later, Mum. I, I must go. I'll, I'll be late. Oh, dear Lillian, what am I going to do? They'll all be so ashamed of me. It happened, you know, all up and down the country. Can you tell me who it was? No. That's something I'm not going to tell anybody. She husband. refused to tell anyone, even her devoted sister Lillian, who the father was. She'd had many flings as a tearaway teen rebel, been involved even for a while with Nelson Gabriel, unreliable son of the old farmer and reprobate Walter Gabriel. But he wasn't the baby's father. That turned out to be a farm worker employed at Brookfield, an Irish charmer called Paddy Redmond. Jenny. It's true, Gran. There's no mistake. You must have taken leave of your senses. Well, there's never been anything like this in the family. Never. Not in the Archers. Well, there it is, Gran. Oh, whatever are we going to do? I'll plug the kettle in, Gran. You look as though you need that cup of tea. Jennifer's grandmother, Doris, talked about touching pitch before she came round to the idea, uttered the immortal words, a baby is a baby, and that's all that matters, and bought Jennifer a carry cot. Angela Piper has played Jennifer Archer 
since her teenage years in 1963 through her love affairs, pregnancies and marriages, the ups and downs of a tumultuous life. In 1966, Angela, like Jennifer, found herself pregnant. It was extraordinary uh, because I was reading my scripts and, and Jennifer was feeling a bit queasy and sort of rushing off the loo. And I thought, oh dear, actually, I'm beginning to feel a little bit weird myself and I don't quite know what this is all about, taking my part too seriously. And then discovered that, in fact, I was also expecting a baby at about the right time, which was, you know, the same time as Jennifer. And then, weirdly enough, the father was Paddy Redmond, who was a cowman. I was a little bit upset about that. And I thought, oh, dear, Jennifer, what are you doing with a cowman? But, of course, the storm that it caused in the programme, in the country, just amazing. I've told you exactly what happened once we were in the waiting room. She insisted on going in by herself first. Then I went in when I was sent for, and the doctor said after he'd examined her that she was perfectly all right, but that he wanted her in hospital for the birth. June Spencer, at 101 years old, has been a member of the Archer's cast since the very beginning and has played Peggy Archer, Jennifer's mother, from the 1960s on. I had very amusing letters, of course, from listeners during that time. I still have one of those letters addressed to Mrs. Peggy Archer, the Bull, Ambridge. And it said, Dear Mrs. Archer, I think you ought to know that your daughter, Jennifer, is going to have a baby. Only three people know, the doctor, the vicar, and your daughter, Lillian. <laughs> Why don't you know? Don't you listen to the programme? <laughs> All of which, amidst a nation gripped by the storyline, earned heartfelt praise from Baroness Sorota in the House of Lords, speaking on behalf of what she called all of us who are Archer's fans. But perhaps not quite all. Oh, what a pity she's taken him away. Oh no, Mum. They take the baby to the nursery several times a day so that Mum can get a bit of a rest. Oh, that's good of them. <laughs> Really, Dad, they've been absolutely marvellous. Well, it was very decent of them to let me come as well. Yes. It's usually husband's only the first day or so. You're quiet, Peg. Tired? Hmm. Just a bit. I was thinking, though. Thinking? I was right, Jack. Remember I said a couple of months back that I'd been looking through my commonplace book and I was fairly certain who the father was? And what makes you so sure now? Well, you saw the baby, didn't you? Well, there was no mistaking it at all. Oh, Lord. To my mind, there couldn't possibly be any mistaking who the father is. Oh, well, at least we know now, don't we? The baby, Adam, was born four weeks after Sergeant Pepper and duly toasted with bubbly, earning an immediate rebuke. Champagne associated with illegitimacy, a censorious listener complained on the phone to the BBC that evening is bound to encourage immorality. Angela Piper. The most astonishing thing was that I got a letter written on lined paper, very flimsy paper, from an elderly couple living in the East End of London. And they wrote saying, we are very, very upset, but concerned, basically, that you're having a baby, Jennifer, and we're so worried that you might get thrown out of the family home. So we would very much like you to come and live with us. And I thought, oh, how sweet, you know, they don't really mean it, but how lovely. I then got another letter saying, my brother is upstairs papering the front bedroom, ready for you to arrive. But the most horrifying moment came when a third letter arrived. My brother is sitting waiting at the station for a train from Hollerton Junction with you on it, with your baby. And at which point I thought, this is past the point of my being able, it's, it's real. These people are taking this so seriously. So did the 60s happen in Ambridge? Well, yes and no. For a start, Jennifer was a tearaway teen. Well, she started off, I, I wasn't told much about her actually. And she was still at school when I started to play her. But however, then after a short while, I was told, you know, she it, make her be more of a sort of dropout. Make her sort of uh, a bit of... Edgy. For sake, pull yourself together, Jennifer, and don't sit there moping. There's your coffee. Oh, all right. What's wrong with you anyway these days? Oh, it doesn't matter. 
I don't suppose you'd understand anyway. Because I'm just an old square, is that it? Ah, those damn fools from Holliton. They speed through the village at anything up to 80 or 90 miles an hour. A leather-clad biker gang roaring through the village. It's a built-up area, surely. 30 mile limit. Knocking poor Walter Gabriel unconscious, which led to a court case in which the hooligans were found guilty. I know him. He's that Ricky from Holliton. Go up, granddad. Keep out. Coffee bars arrived in Borchester, along with jukeboxes, and Ambridge even acquired its own youth club at Arkwright Hall. Down in the valley and now I'm a traveling home. Chorus! For I'm just a lonely and a lonely... Friendville's had the gloves on with me about you youngsters at Arkwright Hall. Oh? Mm, he's pretty niggly, I can tell you. The way the kids bash about in the big room, you know, the one they use for driving and rock and roll. And Mr. Grenville doesn't like it. It's worse than that. He wants to stop teenagers from using the place altogether. Ah, well, you know what the teenage crowd are like these days. They'd wreck the whole place just to show they were displeased. The programme also featured the emergence of Ambridge's own beach group. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my the pleasure swing to along. introduce the swing along. <laughs> John, you don't actually like this pop stuff, do you? Then why not, John? Let's dance, lover boy. Get with it. Well, the squares might object to this number, but the members dig it all right. Well, I always thought you were a Mozart and Beethoven man. I enjoy them too, but the point about pop records, Charles, is that they really mean something to young people. Charles Grenville, local landowner and antique dealer turned bookshop owner, John Tregorin. Yet in truth, Jennifer was really the only authentic 60s character in the village, while Ambridge as a whole remained firmly and seemingly immovably socially conservative in its outlook. And after all, why not? I can tell you this, David, the 60s never happened in Blackburn, a northern friend used to say to me at university in the early 70s. And for Blackburn, he might have said many, many other places. About the same time, a survey of sexual behaviour found that little had changed from ten years earlier. Well, as for music, one shouldn't imagine that Sgt Pepper was the best-selling record of the decade. Instead, it was the sound of music, not, to put it mildly, quite the same thing. As in the 60s, so in some sense through all the other six decades of the programme's long history. Time is on my side, sang the Rolling Stones, and so it is in Ambridge, as quarter of an hour episode by quarter of an hour episode by quarter of an hour episode, most of the plot lines unfold slowly and steadily in real time. Patricia Green, universally known as Paddy, has been playing Jill Archer, Phil's second wife, since the late 1950s, and remembers how the programme came into being as an instructional mechanism for factual farming advice, as supplied by the Ministry of Agriculture. What has been the secret of its success, of its longevity, do you think? Well, truth, I really believe that everybody concerned with it, really, has gone for truth. I mean, of course, it was directive by, by government to begin with, and they were under the thumb of government in the early days. But when the program ceased to be about teaching things and we became just a programme about fun and listening and getting the listeners in. Then it changed, but it, I think the truth thing, as far as one could be truthful, has carried on to this day. So, so broadly, Paddy, you would argue that the Archers has always really stayed in step with real life. I mean, some of the stories have been a bit wild, but then you have to have a few wild stories. But there's truth behind them all. Everything has been based on sincerity, I believe. I mean, I think there's, there's true to life and there's truth. Jeremy Howe is The Archer's current editor. And I mean, I think one of the things that makes The, the Archer's so strong, it is one of the most intensively researched dramas I've ever worked on. I mean, I've worked on drama pretty well throughout my, my whole working life. So it is very true. I mean, one of the most important people um, in our small team is the agricultural story editor, who basically makes sure that we get our farming and agricultural stories right. But I mean, I think the other thing about true and truth is time. And you can only tell the story in the truthfulness of time. Um, if you're pregnant, the pregnancy in the programme has to last nine months. I mean, I think one of the most extraordinary successful and ambitious stories the archers has ever told is jack woolley's descent into alzheimer's which was played out 
over seven years, which is extraordinary. And we've just run an episode, uh, it was Rory's 18th birthday, and we kn we've known for 18 years when that birthday will be. And we've chosen that moment to kind of tie up the story of the loss of his mother. Tim Bentink plays Jill Archer's son, David, who now farms at Brookfield. He recalls how the recent storyline, centering on the love child Rory of Brian Aldridge and Siobhan, born in the early 2000s, already involved almost Chinese-style long-term planning. I mean, there's no other kind of story format in the world, really, that, you know, where people plan 20 years ahead, you know, what's going to happen. I mean, you know, what's just happened with Rory, uh, for instance. Your mum made this recording for your 18th birthday. Your mum? Hmm. Whoa. Are, are you sure you're okay? No, uh, I don't know. It must be like, I mean, oh, that's gonna have her, well, her actual voice. I can't remember her voice. What am I supposed to do, Ben? This, this is her. I know. It's my mum. They planned that. They planned that Siobhan would make a CD for his 18th birthday 18 years ago. She didn't record it then. She actually recorded it just now, but they planned that. <laughs> what other possible format in the world could you have where you do, where you think, oh, well, you know, it's more like sending a space probe out, you know, knowing it's going to land on, on a planet in 18 years. If time is what the Archer's 70 years of storytelling has very much on its side, it's the perennial rituals of village life, of country life, that seem to provide the programme with a particular sense of rhythm. The village of Ambridge lies in the heart of the English countryside, midway between the towns of Borchester and Felpersham. It houses a typical rural community, and in spite of modern advances in agriculture and transport, it has somehow still managed to stay unspoiled. Why it's so enduring is exactly because it's set in a village. It's set to the rhythms of the land. And of course, the, the thing about rural life is that you are absolutely tied to the rhythms of nature. There's a line that David Archer gave. In Brookfield, the sun will always rise and there'll always be cows to be milked. And I think that is fundamental to its distinctiveness and its success. You hire our muck spreader when it's not in use. By George, it's an offer. But you'll be needing it for your own ploughing now, won't yes, you? Yes, though? of course we will, but not but all the Ned, time. you might not have any work to do, but I'm up to my neck. You don't want to prepare too much of this at the time, house. It'll go off. What do you know about it? As much as you and more, Nigel. I have been a feeding cattle a darn sight longer than ever you have, and don't you forget it. Look, Simon, Ned, you can leave the pigs to me. Well, the afternoon milking gaffer and then there's... Uh, a... Having, from its inception, had agriculture and farming yeah. methods baked into its DNA, the Archers has always boasted an agricultural story editor, whose role is to advise on appropriate farming stories, to check the accuracy of its agricultural references, and to make sure, generally, that everything's in order down on the farm. The current holder of the role is Sarah Swaddling. I think change in farming over the 70 years that we have has been central to the programme. So if you look at what Brookfield does now compared to what Brookfield might have done 70 years ago, you'd see, you know, the changes of the last 70 years or so. What we do always is try as hard as we can to be a microcosm of English farming life or, or English village life. So with Brookfield, originally Brookfield was the home of Doris and Dan Archer and Dan at the beginning of the show is the kind of the good guy, the good farmer who's doing his best to try and modernise and keep up with the times, with the expectations of, of government and policy makers. So one of the first farming stories in The Archers is Dan deciding to get a tractor and he's a bit sad about saying goodbye to the horses but he does the right thing by the horses and he finds some good new homes so he embraces progress but he's a man of heart and that's kind of where Brookfield has stayed in the program is that that it's the sort of moral compass of the program. The farming year with its ritual round of activities lies at the heart of a way of life in which baking and jam making at Brookfield, 
or Jennifer's elaborate catering for the shoots at home farm, or ploughing contests, or the annual flower and produce show, occupy far more energy and mental space than worrying about latest developments at Westminster, albeit every now and then there's a carefully impartial topical nod in that direction, as here to Rab Butler's budget back in 1952. Hey, hey up, Phil. What? It's gone six. Switch on the news. Oh, good gracious, yes. See what Mr Butler's mm. done for us, or, or to us. Mm. Yeah. Well, whatever he says, I've got a feeling it's not going to be very pleasant, Dan. <laughs> I'll bet your cigarettes go up. An income tax. Mr Checker has proposed oh, in his is. budget statement oh, yeah. cuts in the food subsidies oh, and concessions. Even so, for many years, it was not too Ambridge difficult to guess which way Ambridge tended to vote. Bill Smethurst was writer and Archer's editor for many years. Well, here we've got the original continuity cards, which were started in 1951. So we've got Dan Archer here. It tells you a bit about him, and it says, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative. Doris Archer, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative. Former Archer's producer and writer, Joanna Toy. It's all very interesting. On one of the first continuity cards, it stated that, you know, Dan votes Conservative. But since those days, the Archers has always tried very strictly not to be political. I think William, in the early 80s, named an MP as so-and-so, and the implication was that they would be Tory. But it's always been very difficult to keep the characters in a sort of middle place. Yet overall, politics has played only a bit part. There's absolutely no election going on there at all noted one radio critic about Ambridge in October 1974 as Edward Heath and Harold Wilson slugged it out in a parallel universe. And that seems to me entirely realistic. Instead, Ambridge is and always has been very much its own world, with its own particular very local concerns. For all the ups and downs between individual characters, a functioning, cohesive community with one time-honoured and near-sacred institution at its very heart, the Bull. Here, in the bar, 69 years ago, are Phil Archer, his brother Jack, Walter Gabriel, and the then licensee, Sam. He meant to go 25 double 15. You could see it in his eyes. Ah, rubbish. You're right, all right. Give him his beer, Sam. I ain't got no room for a fella that comes into a pub with nothing in his pocket and, and gets his beer for free all night on the dartboard. Well, I've got to do it that way, Walter. I'm as poor as a church mouse. Yeah, uh, have one, Jack. Just a quick one, then. Yeah, I was afraid you would. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to go back and relieve Simon. He's watching the sulphur. Well, Phil, your dad coming in for one tonight? Oh, it all depends when the parish council meeting ends, I suppose. Oh, ah, yes, yes. I hope somebody will say something about them blocked up drains outside the village hall. Oh, don't worry. Dad's been rehearsing his little piece ever since the night of the harvest supper. Yeah, yeah. The Bull yeah. is a place in the village, like a lot of village pubs, where, and it's very useful for us in terms of storytelling, because it's where people bump into each other randomly. The Archer's current editor, Jeremy Howe. The number of closures of rural pubs is legion. And we were tracking this when we invented the rather delicious story of uh, uh, Lillian and Justin said, let's try and do something with a bull to zhuzh it up. And they renamed it the Beard Ambridge. And um, quite rightly, not only did the audience throw up their hands in horror and disbelief, but I can tell you when I unleashed the story to the cast, they also threw up their hands in disbelief and horror. You can't do that. It's the bull. It's the bull. What are you doing? Oh, Lillian, excellent. Oh, it's a banner. What's it for? Oh, it's announcing the official launch of the Bee at Ambridge. We were going to discuss that. The bull lies at the serial's very centre, and at the geographical centre, too, of Ambridge. It's the place for gossip, for banter, for arguments, for human interaction, even as the food on offer transmutes over the years from steak to plowns to something sporadically more nouvelle cuisine. Though the recent attempted trendy renaming proved a step too far. Here we go. How does that look? Celebrate your local. That's a good slogan. Oh, you like it? Yeah. And on Tuesday, the 3rd of March, yeah. with a free bee at Ambridge cocktail. <laughs> What's going in the cocktail? When we first like came to the pool in the 50s, it was yeah. very much, I think, you know, a spit and sawdust pub with sort of pickled eggs on the bar. And then Jack and Peggy took over and they instituted this thing, the play bar, which was like a coffee bar, which, of course, were all over Soho at the time. So that was Ambridge kind of embracing the whole teenage thing. Things moved on. 
by the 70s, we've got a steak bar in the bowl because that's how things were then. Then along comes Cathy, who has been a domestic science teacher. She actually introduced nouvelle cuisine to the bowl at the end of the 80s. So you've got Clary sort of being a bit baffled by mango coolie on everything. Along comes Joey, and she's a performer. She opens up the bull upstairs as a kind of music venue. And lately, there's been the story about the renaming of the pub. So in that kind of way, that's how the village moves on. Former scriptwriter Joanna Toy. Of course, it's a sociological truism that community tends to go hand in hand with mistrust of outsiders, even hostility to them. And Ambridge is no exception, unless those intrepid incomers are working farmers. Ah, oh, Mr Grenville? Yes. Oh, good. I've been waiting to see you. Really? Yes, I've been in correspondence with you. Uh, name of Woolley. Jack Woolley. Dare say you've heard of me. Uh, look, we're in the age of opportunity, aren't we? And opportunism. And I intend to make the most of both. You can't hinder me, Grenville, whatever you say, because your sort are on the rapid decline. You've amused me intensely during the last few weeks. I have, have I? To my mind, it's typical of your class. And what is my class? The snobbish and the despicable. Now, look here. You called me a scheming hound. Why shouldn't I say what I think about you? You, Grenville, when you felt yourself attacked, had immediate recourse to ancient privileges, rights of way, hoping you might be able to dig something out of the past to come to your aid. I live in today. Among others, today. Jack Woolley and Sid Perks, coming from relatively nearby Birmingham in 1963, or Linda and Robert Snell, arriving from home county Sunningdale in 1986, all had to work their passages, taking many years before gaining some sort of acceptance. Villages are inward looking, but I think they're quite accepting. One of the most interesting outsiders of late is Natasha, who has married Tom. And I mean, I think Ambridge is pretty, pretty welcoming of Natasha. I think the interesting thing is the audience are deeply suspicious of Natasha. And, you know, I can see why the audience is suspicious of Natasha, because two of the most recent incomers to Ambridge um, big time have been Matt Crawford, who created Mayhem, or Rob Titchener, who kind of nearly destroyed Helen Archer. And, and villages have changed a lot, haven't they? I mean, there is a relentless suburbanisation of villages that's happened over the last 70 years. And so they're kind of used to incomers. And I mean, I think the, the trajectory of a character like Linda Snell, who, who came in from Surrey and has worked relentlessly hard as an outsider to make herself part of the village. So she's found her niche there. And I think villages are quite welcoming, but at the same time, they're quite hostile. It's a weird conundrum. While Carol is showing Jack Woolley around her glass houses, she notices they're being watched from a parked Land Rover. Not recognizing who it is, she goes to investigate. Excuse me, do you need any help? No, thanks, I've got all I want. And you seem very interested in the market garden. One of Ambridge's most famous incomers was Brian Aldridge, who's been part of the village's narrative, agricultural, emotional, financial and argumentative, since he first arrived on the lookout for a new farming opportunity in 1975. His appearance provokes the suspicions of local market gardener Carol Tregoran. I'm not very good at names either. Or explanations. I shouldn't have thought any were necessary. Well, at least we can introduce ourselves. I'm Carol Tregoran. Aldridge, Brian Aldridge. How do you do? What you about the relationship the between sorry, old money and new money? Because the Britain of the 1950s, old money was still top dog. And then progressively, and particularly I think in the 1980s, new money really came to the fore. Has that been mirrored in, in Ambridge? I think when, when Brian came in, he was an example of new money, wasn't he? Vanessa Whitburn was the Archer's long-serving editor from 1991 to 2013. And there was a lot of distrust around Brian at the time. What was he going to do, you know? I think money coming from sources that people aren't sure of, there's always been a suspicion. But I think, you know, Matt Crawford's money and also money being less stable. You know, you could lose it. You could lose it quickly. Whereas um, no one ever thought Dan and Doris would, you know, lose what money they had. I think Ambridge, in all honesty, is less snobbish than it used to be. You know, people aren't going to immediately regard a newcomer as brash unless they appear brash. Actor Tim Bentink, who plays Jennifer's cousin David Archer, knows village life from the inside and says Ambridge represents an accurate portrayal of both the physical and human relationships that villages possess. 
Well, I'm in a village here. I'm up in Norfolk, and my son and and his partner live in the next village. And I was up here working the other day, and suddenly my son came along, knocked on the door, and said, "Oh, I was just passing. Just thought I'd pop in." You know, when that doesn't, <laughs> when does that happen in London? <laughs> that happens. Um, gossip happens in a village. People know each other. I know more people in this village. We've been here twenty years than I do in London. It's community, and I think that's again. The important thing about the arches is it reflects the idea of a community and you have archetypes within that community and you've got the you know you've got the squire you've got the doctor you've got the go- the village gossip you've you know you've got the the, the ne'er do well i mean one of the things that people always come up to me <laughs> is to say i am you know brian aldridge or uh, actually linda snell is pretty well always uh, i think you'll find that i'm the linda snell of this village <laughs> I'm so sorry, Linda. Uh, it doesn't matter, Ruth. You're only a few minutes late. Shall I close the door? Yes, we'll make sure we're a little warmer next week, won't I've, we? I've saved a seat for you here, love. And that's something else we could do with next week, something to sit on. But otherwise, I'm sure we're all very grateful to David and Ruth for letting us use their barn. Our pleasure. I didn't think you were staying. She says I've got to. <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> So, are we talking then about some sort of English equivalent to what is called La France Profonde? In other words, that deep and timeless France, far away from Paris and other big cities. Godfrey Baisley was editor of The Archers at its inception and helped create it 70 years ago. The programme The Archers is, as we see it, a true picture of English rural life. It is sometimes larger than life simply because it's a dramatic presentation and it needs that to make its points. But we must go through the natural pattern. This is vital, this movement on. I think many other serials have probably failed here in the fact that they don't go on. And that's where you lose this naturalness. This, I I feel, is vital, absolutely vital. It's tempting to think that Ambridge does indeed represent some sort of timeless quintessence of Englishness, especially gazing down from Lakey Hill, spiritual heart of Ambridge. I love it up here, the 94-year-old matriarch, Peggy, in the programme from the very start, tells her grandson Adam in June 2019 after he has driven her up there. Thank you, Adam, for doing me this favour. It's a pleasure. Although I did wonder why you wanted me to drive you up Lakey Hill this early. I love it up here. I first saw this view when I was new to Ambridge. After London, I I was mesmerised by everything. The clean air, the animals, the people. If ever things got really difficult with your grandfather, and they did get difficult sometimes, I'd come up here, remind myself how much bigger than me the world is. It's high up, it overlooks Ambridge. It was something of that. I mean, one one climbs a hill and feels somehow above everything, physically as well as mentally. June Spencer, Paddy Green, who's played Jill Archer from her first appearance in Ambridge in 1957, sees Lakey Hill in spiritual terms. Lakey Hill was there before Ambridge. And so that's God's bit of Ambridge, really. And it looks over most of Ambridge. It has sheep there. It is where people go when they're in despair, when they're in love. Dan died there. And that is the enduring symbol of Ambridge, I I think. Back then there were more farms, smaller, but a lot more than now. At this time of the morning it would be teeming with people working. Now you're checking crops by, what do you call them, those amazing flying cameras? (laughs) Drones. Oh, yes, of course. When we went into lockdown and had to radically alter the way that we made the programme. Current agricultural story editor... Sarah Swaddling. The first place we thought of for the first scene in the first episode was Lakey Hill. So it's not the centre of the village. If you're in the bull, you're right in the middle of the village and, and you lose sight of the big picture. But Lakey Hill is the place where characters see and where we see the big picture about Ambridge. The history books relate that the location of Ambridge lies more or less in the Cotswolds, or is said to have been modelled on the Worcestershire village of Inkbarrow. However, for current writer on the serial Tim Stimson, the view from Lakey Hill belongs in his native Shropshire. 
I grew up literally looking out of my bedroom window over the Ironbridge Gorge and the Reekin in Shropshire. And so I guess somewhere in my head, Lakey Hill is, is the Reekin. You know, the Blue Remembered Hills, A. E. Houseman's the Shropshire lad. And I think that is when, when people go up there, it is that having a perspective on life, a theme that, that continuity with other generations. At the end of the big flood week, I think Pip and David went up to the top of Lakey Hill and looked over the flooded landscape. Oh, wow. Oh. Wow, what a view. That's just surreal. Look at all the houses. It's like a lake. How long is it going to take to go back down? Well, that depends on the weather. Weeks, probably. Mm. It's kind of beautiful, though, isn't it? From up here, anyway. Of course it is. Come on. It's our home. And it always will be. In her recent journey up Lakey Hill with her grandson, Adam, Peggy turned philosophical. And indeed explains to Adam later in the scene, nothing stands still forever, not even in the countryside. And as we know, the fundamental purpose of the Archers when it began in 1951 was, with strong and direct guidance from the Ministry of Agriculture, to encourage and teach Britain's farmers to embrace change, not continuity, and adopt modern, intensive methods in order to provide cheap food for urban consumers. Sarah Swaddling. I think the attitude to progress in farming has evolved quite considerably in the Archers. So when the programme is first conceived as a means of spreading new ideas about farming as part of the great post-war food production drive, then, you know, production is all. But as the programme evolved and, you know, through the 70s, the Ministry of Agriculture ceased to be involved in the programme, the programme and the character's attitude to progress has, has shifted subtly. So as the public discourse about farming has, has changed and become more sceptical about some of the costs of that post-war production drive. So the forces of progress in inverted commas, of modernity, new technology, are not always seen as wholly good. Yet, by the early 1960s of the latest, especially as a result of Rachel Carson's stirring and influential book, The Silent Spring, highlighting the ecological and wildlife damage done by pesticides and other modern farming practices, a critical mass of opinion was starting to dispute that whole direction of travel. Sadly, little of this percolated through to Ambridge. These days, there's a thoroughly varied farming ecology in Ambridge. Phoebe Rex and Pip's rewilding project rubs shoulders with the intensive pig unit at Barrow Farm, and the mood is of nervous apprehension come excitement about the imponderables of the new agricultural dispensation under Brexit that lies ahead. Ah, and here's the master himself. You've got to hand it to him. Grenville looks well on a horse. He does, and he's coming over. Well, I'll get him some grog. Tell him not to move off. Ah, right, old Jack. Morning, Forrest. Ah, morning, sir. Nice and crisp. Yes. Jack's just got in for a stirrup cup. Ah, Ambridge is a more complicated place when it comes to our great oh, national devil, obsession, social class, whatever the efforts of politicians to persuade us that we're becoming a classless society. Oh, by the way, Forrest, you organised the shoot for our farmer friends? Yes. As soon as you've moved off, we'll be off too. It's all laid on, sir. Well, good shooting. Thank you, sir, and good hunting to you too. Oh, you. Once there was a seemingly immovable social hierarchy with the deferentially treated archers at the top of the farming pile and families like the Grundys and the Larkins at or near the bottom, depicted largely as figures of fun and seldom as convincing three-dimensional characters in their own right. Looks as though our worthy huntsman's rearing to go. Bye for now. Bye, sir. Editor Jeremy Howe. I mean, I think if you look back to the position of class in rural England in the 1950s, it was a much tighter corset and you know there was a definite pecking order starting with the aristocracy and going down to casual farm laborers but i mean i think generally the notion of class has become much muddier in the intervening 70 years if we look at susan carter susan carter is a horribin but i think susan carter sees herself as middle class her younger sister tracy i think would see herself as working class she's very much of the horribin clan and the, Ho the horribins for decades have been the kind of the, the underclass of Ambridge. However, the interesting thing, I think, is that Susan Carter, who sees herself as middle class, 
is married to a pig man, whereas Tracy Horobin is going out with an actor. So who's middle class, who's working class? It's, it's, it's much muddier, much less well-defined than you'd ever imagine. Yet all that said, hard edges linger. Jennifer, no longer a 60s rebel, was far from thrilled about her daughter Alice marrying Susan's son Christopher, given his mother's Horobin background. Today, the new and convincing voice of dissent within the Ambridge social order comes from Christopher's big sister, Emma. It's no coincidence that these strong-minded characters, Susan, Tracy, Emma, are all women. And fittingly so, given that the ever-larger role being played by women is one of the central themes of Britain's modern social history. Indeed, Ambridge was ahead of the curve when in the 50s, that immediate post-war era forever associated with male dominance and lack of female ambition or scope, it was Peggy who had the licence for the ball and had to manage the pub because of the drinking and general uselessness of her first husband, Jack. Huh. That lot of confidence you've got in me. Oh, what's the use? You may never forgive me for this. It could possibly be between us always, but I'm sorry my future lies here, and yours could too. But I will not encourage your restiveness, and that's that. You mean you get along without me very well, eh? Don't you see? No, that... I don't. All right, then. You must do the other thing. I'll just have to go it alone. She had quite a lot to cope with. She had two mm. little girls, of course, and, mm. Uh, mm. and another one on the way. Mm. I think it was just a very hard change for her to come down to this little small holding with its primitive ways, which she wasn't used to, of course. And uh, she obviously was a very strong character and has continued to be throughout the years. Actress June Spencer, the incarnation of Peggy Archer for the best part of seven decades. Then in the 1970s, decade of Germaine Greer, spare rib and second wave feminism, arrived Pat, soon to win the heart of Peggy's son, Tony Archer, and change his life and attitudes forever. Former scriptwriter Joanna Toy. What happened was that in 1979, William Smethurst, who'd been on the writing team since 76 and was an ex-journalist, took over as editor of The Archers. And he brought in what he called very proudly his left-wing feminist writers, who did bring a different tone to the programme. And, you know, Pat, who'd always been uh, a very strong character, she got involved with CND, she went to a women's studies course. Of course, Bridge Farm then went organic. So Pat getting involved with, I mean, was she actually involved with Greenham Common as such, or was it more... I uh, don't think Pat ever went to Greenham Common herself, but she had a friend who she'd met at uh, Borchester Tech, as it then was, uh, who had been, and who came to stay with them at Bridge Farm. And this was a sort of classic William touch. Pat cancelled the Daily Express in favour of The Guardian. And Tony was just outraged because he'd always liked looking at the gambols, the cartoon and The Express. So William was terribly, terribly good at these little touches, which was a real sort of show-not-tell as to the way things were moving. But as prominent standard-bearer of new feminist thinking, Pat wasn't long to be alone in The Archers. Later in the 80s, Tony's cousin David Archer married Ruth, a practical-minded Geordie determined to be treated as an equal and with zero interest in being the traditional farmer's wife when it came to the kitchen or domesticity generally. Ruth what people held most against Ruth Jill particularly was that she didn't cook and fed David on pizza and peanut butter sandwiches, which was just unthinkable to Jill. But Ruth came in and again, she came from a background, not just that wasn't farming, you know, her father had a factory, shock horror. But because she was very prepared from the beginning to be a, a proper partner to David and to muck in, she did earn respect. You come to give me a hand? Yeah, OK, then. Well, I've just got these others to see, too. Um, if you could shove some hay in the feeders. No problem. Guess who I've just had on the phone? Huh? From the Soon next generation that. down, take Debbie uh, Aldridge, nicely described by one listener in 2002 as the immensely capable combine-driving Debbie who can deliver half a dozen lambs before breakfast and who now runs a large-scale agricultural enterprise in Hungary. In short, independent-minded women everywhere. But, of course... If we compare the Britain of the 2020s with the Britain of the 1950s, there has been, perhaps, an even more profound and fundamental shift. Do you remember that day you helped me move in? Of course I do. You said to me, what if I'm making a terrible mistake coming to Ambridge? What if people won't accept me? Do you remember that? I mean, of course, the shift from an overwhelmingly monocultural society to an increasingly multi-ethnic, multicultural society. 
Yet in practice, there are, even now, two very different Britons. According to the latest official figures for 2018, minority ethnic groups account for almost 19% of the population in urban areas, but barely 2%, 2.4% to be exact, in rural areas. But in 1973, the Community Relations Commission was already complaining about the failure of the Archers to portray Britain as a multiracial society. Here we are. Home again. Look at it. Idyllic, isn't it? The daffodils and the crocuses. That's where I live. Me, Usha Gupta from Hounslow. I still don't believe it sometimes. Eventually, in 1991, the first Asian arrived on the scene in the person of Usha Gupta, a solicitor from a family living near Wolverhampton. Gradually, she integrated into the village, but then, in 1995, found herself the object of racist intimidation and violence from a shadowy group which included the teenage Roy Tucker. Well, do you know the worst thing about this? There's somebody out there hates me that much and they've never even spoken to me. Don't think about it. They're not worth well, it. Well, that's how it feels. I think it's played out slowly, as it probably would do in quite a lot of villages, but I certainly felt in my time as editor that we needed to mirror it in some way. Racism is something that happens in cities and towns, not the sticks, claimed critics of the storyline. Not so, insisted the programme's editor, Vanessa Whitburn. And that's why I brought in Usha. And I brought in later Lucas Madakani and his family. The big character that stayed for a length of time was Usha. She's still there now. And when Usha joined the village, Roy and a gang of lads subjected her to a series of racist abuse. And, you know, we were criticised a little bit when I was editor for bringing characters and not showing racism, truly. Now, I would point to that story, and my feeling is that, that drama's got a moral responsibility, and I don't believe you put out racist abuse just because people do it. Some people do it. As long as you don't dodge the issue. And, and we did a story which involved change. They're much younger than you are now. In the dark ages. <laughs> well, they were, if you were gay. Not that things are perfect now, but it's easy to forget how bad things were. One of my friends got beaten up quite badly. In 1996, the village acquired its first openly out gay character in Sean Myerson, admittedly a decade after Colin Russell in Albert Square. It was a small town, everyone knew who'd done it. Nobody was going to do anything about it. <laughs> it was scared. I didn't go out for weeks. No. But I realised I had a choice. If I stayed in my room for the rest of my life, they'd won. So... I didn't. And no punches were pulled as he endured a homophobic campaign against him from Sid Perks. 1996 was also the year that domestic violence arrived, crucially in terms of taking on a long silent taboo, middle class domestic violence, as Simon Pemberton smacked the back of his hand across Shula's face. Yet it would be almost another two decades before the emotional come psychological story of our time again very much behind closed doors, was gruellingly played out in Ambridge. Rob, I'm in the kitchen. Hi. Oh, well, that was well-timed. Oh, God. What? That smell. Rob, what's the <sighs> matter? You're not cooking tuna. Oh, yes. Oh, I loathe tuna. The, the, the smell, I can't stand it. For anyone living on a different planet some five or six years ago, the bald storyline was this. Rob Titchener, a good-looking and successful former dairy farmer, arrives in early 2013 and soon becomes closely involved with Helen Archer oh, and her you young son, Henry. Oh, he might have a nap before lunch. He looks tired. So he should be. He ran around that field for well over an hour, climbing on the fence and jumping over... Tim Stimson was the writer largely responsible for working out, with editor Sean O'Connor, the intricate and horrific dance of coercive control that Rob Titchener, played by Tim Watson, exerted on Pat and Tony's daughter, Helen Archer, brilliantly interpreted by Louisa Patikas. So we had Rob Titchener, our mega dairy manager, and then Sean O'Connor became editor of The Archers, and um, he'd heard something in the actor's voice, and you just don't know that this is going to happen until you start hearing the actor on air, that just gave it a slightly more sinister edge. And he said, OK, so I want Rob to start coercively controlling Helen, and we're going to run it for two years, and at the end of it... She's going to stab and kill him. And that was the only thing that changed was that he didn't die. He successfully proposes, but listeners start to become aware of the unnerving psychological control 
he's increasingly exercising, including cutting her off from family and friends over a more and more tormented and destabilised Helen. What could it possibly be about you that's so terrible, that's so ugly and off-putting? Hmm? I... Come on, tell me. Oh, I need some water. Helen. Oh, I have a bad head in the morning. Don't run away. Go. The whole thing was painstakingly researched. It was incredible. Actor Louisa Patikas. And I think that the element of, you know, eavesdropping on the characters' domestic lives and hearing that slow isolation of Helen from her friends and family and work was just brilliant. And that's why it worked so well and over such a long period of time. I just also think the format of The Archers just was absolutely perfect for that kind of story. You know, the short daily episodes which allow the brilliant scriptwriters to reveal that slow burn, you know, the insidious nature of, of Rob's behaviour. It all bears out what I've been trying to tell you. Women change when they're pregnant. It means that you're not always in a position to make clear judgments and decisions. I'm so sure he'd be all right. You shouldn't even be having to deal with this kind of situation. Your priority is our little boy growing away inside you. That's the only thing that matters. Let me take care of the rest. The storyline ended up peaking along the same time as the change in in the law. I mean, co coercive control was criminalised in 2015, December 2015, and that's when our storyline was really peaking. So there was that obvious kind of attention from the press and the media, but everything together kind of, kind of combined to become something greater than it was on its own, if you know I what I mean. This may be one of the tastiest meals you've ever cooked. Makes me wonder why you don't make it more often. You know why. Sorry, couldn't hear you. I said you know why. You told me you didn't like tuna. <laughs> when did I ever say that? Ages ago. No, you imagined it. I didn't. You must have done, darling. I love tuna. Oh, OK, then. Uh, now, I want to see you clear at least half of your plate. What do I mean? You just try to control me. You won't let me out. I can't use my phone. <laughs> I'm not even allowed to wear the clothes. I... <laughs> Don't laugh. In 2016... Not long after, in the real world, legislation has been enacted it around coercive a control. Sad, pathetic little man. Get out of my way. Oh! She, heavily pregnant as a result of marital rape and goaded beyond endurance, stabs him. You, you want to know how you can leave? Rob. You see this knife? Oh! Take it. Come on, put it in your hand. The atmosphere was very, very quiet in studio, very focused. We knew it was a big moment. It was, you know, three years in the telling. And, yes, it felt like live theatre. We had a little bit of a chat at the beginning with Tim, the writer, about, you know, the physical side of things, the stab, the actual stabbing. Right, come here, you little... Ralph! Get your hands off him! Don't touch him! Oh, 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 oh. I, uh, sorry. <coughs> Helen. Sorry. Uh, put, put, put the uh, knife down. Helen! Ah! Oh, 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 no! no. Oh. <coughs> Mummy! Yeah, it was a very, very powerful moment for all of us. The programme's handling of the issue earned widespread praise, including from Baroness Hale of the Supreme Court. And in this new emotional terrain it occupies, the story represents, for the moment anyway, some kind of apotheosis, unimaginable, simply unimaginable, in an earlier Ambridge, where the melodramas came thick and fast, but all too seldom with psychological depth and richness. But of course, it was not only Helen Archer on trial in 2016. So too, in the referendum that June, was Britain's relationship with Europe. We certainly worked out which of our farmers would vote which way and had families that were divided in terms of how they voted. I, I don't know what Ambridge's constituency would be, but is it too much of a stretch to surmise it would have voted Leave? Oh, I think so, yeah. yeah. No, we, we were very aware that you know the majority of the farming community were, were voting Leave. But I think when it, an issue that is so divisive, you don't want to foreground people's politics, let alone the fact we're doing it on the BBC, and the BBC <laughs> has to be impartial. So, again, it's always a, a tricky line to tread. Writer Tim Stimson. The aftermath of a narrow vote in favour of Brexit was a country more divided, in many ways along cultural wars lines, than at any time in our collective memory. Is it conceivable that our oldest regular drama can point a way out of this unhappy situation? Keeping an eye on how Brexit will play out in Ambridge is the serial's agricultural story editor, Sarah Swadling. 
yes, it's been a huge story in the real world, but it's been quite tricky to reflect within the archers because so much is still is unclear. The changes in how farm sport is delivered will start to kick in in 2021 and they will be phased in over seven years. So Brexit is almost running on two timelines. There might be or might not be a period of acute disruption at the beginning of 2021 But actually, the big structural, potentially landscape altering changes will happen more gradually. Arguably, there's a paradox at work. On the one hand, Ambridge as a rural community would almost certainly have voted leave. On the other hand, the predominant social attitudes now on display in the village do seem more aligned to remain. Can the archers somehow have a healing effect? encouraging us to reach across and start listening rather more tolerantly to the other side. Just possibly. And I'll end with the thought that if we spent less time with screeching tabloid headlines and on echo chamber social media, and more time on our own particular Lakey Hill, looking calmly at things in perspective, like the nonagenarian Peggy Archer, with her hard-won experience of life in its endlessly fascinating non-binary complexity, we might all benefit. That's the one thing about it all, Adam. The countryside keeps moving, changing. You'll notice it more when your baby comes. Our offspring, their offspring, and the generations after are such a powerful yardstick for time. Sometimes it goes your way. Sometimes you feel like it's against you. But it's always moving, changing. (laughs) 